Good morning, or well, sorry, good afternoon, in fact, and welcome to this IFG Live event about the UK Internal Market Bill in the House of Lords. Since its introduction, this legislation to prevent the emergence of barriers to trade within the UK has ignited not one, but two major constitutional battles. The week the bill was first published, news headlines focused on the powers it gave ministers to break international law by being able to implement aspects of the Northern Ireland Protocol contrary to the international treaty agreed with the EU last year. This sparked an outcry, including an intervention for, from a US presidential candidate and also criticism from some of those on the Conservative backbenches. While a government amendment was enough to stave off a rebellion in the Commons, it is not clear the government will be able to do the same in the Lords. Last week saw the biggest defeat in the House of Lords since the 1999 reforms, um, as 395 peers to 169 voted to back an amendment opposing the pass of the bill that would give ministers the power to break international law. But the bill is not just about the Northern Ireland Protocol. The provisions regulating trade between the nations has huge implications for devolution. Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister of Scotland, has said the bill is a full frontal assault on devolution. Mark Drakeford, first minister of Wales, has said it is an enormous power grab. The Lord's Constitution Committee in their report last week has said it risks destabilising an integral part of the UK's constitutional arrangements. So as the UK internal market bill enters committee stage in the House of Lords later, we are holding this event to discuss all of these issues and more. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by an excellent panel. I'm joined by Baroness Smith of Basildon, shadow leader of the House of Lords, Lords Bru Lord Bruce of Benicky, um, Liberal Democrat spokesperson on Scotland in the House of Lords, Lord Dunlop, uh, he's Conservative peer, former Lords Minister in both the Northern Ireland and Scotland office, and also member of the Constitution Committee. And last but not least, my colleague Jess, Jess Sargent, who is a senior researcher at the IFG, who has been leading our response to the UK Internal Market Bill. Now, before we get going, I just want to say that this event is on the record and a recording will be available afterwards. Do tweet along using the hashtag IFGBrexit and send in your questions. I can already see a couple have come in already um, using the, the chat function on your screen, and I will try and get through as many of them as possible as we discuss this, these important issues. So to get going with the discussion, um, I will come to you first, Baroness Smith. Um, we will get into sort of the detailed provisions of the bill in a moment, but I'm quite interested in your sort of the overall approach the Lords might take to the bill. It's sort of quite notable that how quickly the bill passed its stages in the Commons. What expectations do you think there are on peers as they scrutinise this legislation? Well, it won't be as quick as it was in the Commons, and I think we'll my take on it is we probably, I would say we look at it carefully, we'll look at it forensically and very seriously. And I think it is quite a difficult and complex bill over basically a very, very sort of easy and simple premise. But the way it's been, I think, has made things quite difficult. For me, there's a mystery right at the heart of this bill. It's why is the government doing it in this way, the tone? And I think the bit that most people are aware of, and the public who are interested in these things, um, what do you know about this bill? They'll say the rule of law, the government wants to break international law. But it's the very same attitude I think the government has to that aspect of the bill that comes through the rest of the bill, which is really about the devolution arrangements um, across the UK. It's that same arrogance, um, that same almost very really macho approach to politics that it will be done this way. And if we look at the work that's been done on the common framework, if we look at how things could have been done, there could have been a far greater engagement, a better engagement um, with the devolved administrations. And, uh, I think if we sort of look at how the UK operates, our constitutional arrangements are now embedded in the UK. They're part and parcel of who we are, how we operate. At times it's been tested, but it's been also very successful and thought through. And if we try to get away from that, as this bill does in so many ways, um, then that causes, I think, Lord's a lot of concerns. So I think there'll be, in many ways, two particular aspects. One is the constitutional implications of the bill, um, which is of great interest. And if you look at our constitutional committee report, um, of which Anne Dunlop is, is a member, um, that's quite scathing. Also, how the bill uses powers for future and delegated House Committee looks at that as well, Henry VIII powers, for example, and powers it takes to government without reference to the devolved administration in the future and Parliament. And I think all of that comes together. So my sense is that the Lords will be um, quite firm about the constitutional arrangements that exist currently in the UK. 
will want to see significant changes to the bill, not against you know, the, some will try and make it anti or pro Brexit and read that into it. This is beyond that. And if you look at the vote we had this week, with I think the biggest majority that we've seen in the House of Lords since the hereditary peers basically left, um, which brought together people from across the House of different views to say the rule of law is fundamental to the kind of country we are. And I think this bill strikes to the heart of the kind of country we are and the kind of devolution arrangement we want to maintain. Thanks. And I think that, yeah, you've, you've very nicely sort of raised, I think, quite a lot of the issues that we want to get into over the next hour. And I think particularly some of those questions about the future of the UK and the implications of the bill for the union. And again, I can sort of see some of the questions coming through in the chat are addressing those. So I think that the best thing from my perspective to do is let's let's start with some of those rule of law issues, the Northern Ireland questions, because as you say, that seems to have got the most attention. And I think it is worth discussing that. And I would be interested to hear on, on your, all of your views on um, how, how peers might address that and then come on to some of those broader constitutional questions later in the discussion. So if I can turn to you, Jess, first. Now, you've done a huge amount of work on both the Northern Ireland Protocol and also the contents of the UKIM bill. So could you just sort of set out for us what what powers has the government taken this bill and, and why are they saying that they wanted that they need to take them? Yeah, so the UK government argues that the powers it's taken in respect to the Northern Ireland Protocol are necessary to guard against extreme or unreasonable interpretations of the protocol from the EU. So the example it gave during the common stage um, was this potential threat um, that the EU may have posed um, that could prevent uh, agri-food products, so food of products of animal origin, um, from uh, entering Northern Ireland from Great Britain. Now, it's not clear how credible that threat was, um, but actually the powers that the government is taking in the bill won't necessarily guard against that. Um, they're much more narrow. Um, so it takes two powers to potentially act um, in contrary to the protocol and to international law. The first is to determine the exit procedures for goods leaving Northern Ireland. So most of um, the new processes and paperwork um, required by the protocol require on goods going between Great Britain, so from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. There's one bit of paperwork that is required on goods neither leaving Northern Ireland and the bill would give the, power, the UK government the power to waive that. Um, the second power is on the application of Article Article 10, which applies EU state aid law in Northern Ireland. Now, the UK government is concerned that the application of that of that law to Northern Ireland could be broader than it first expected and could actually capture some UK wide measures if they have implications for Northern Ireland. Um, so what it does is it would allow ministers to add a slightly narrower interpretation of that provision. Now, these are both things that the UK government is either asking for um, in the joint committee with respect to waiving exit summary declarations, or that could be resolved through the future relationship, um, particularly we're thinking here about state aid. So there's a question here about whether the UK government really intends to use these powers, um, or whether it's kind of potentially a negotiating ploy to try and have a bearing on trying to get agreement with the EU. Thanks, Jess. And I, I actually I think I'm going to come back to you almost immediately with a question that's come through um, already from Ronan Cormacain. And I'm sorry if I've just butchered your surname. Um, but Ronan's asked sort of, how much credence should we give to the government's claim that it, the bill is about protecting the Good Friday Agreement, um, given that the Northern Ireland Assembly have refused to pass a legislative consent motion? I mean, do you think that, you know, that is something that we've heard the government say before? I mean, do you think that's a fair claim from the government? I think there are big questions of whether the, the the biggest motivation for the government is to protect the Good Friday Agreement. As I mentioned, the powers are actually uh, quite narrow um, and things like exit summary declarations, Northern Ireland businesses aren't particularly concerned about. They're more concerned about the requirements um, for goods going between Great Britain and Northern Ireland that actually aren't affected um, by any of the provisions of the bill. Um, I think the other thing that this move has done is potentially brought the whole question um, of the protocol and of a uh, hard border on the island of Ireland back up 
you know, matters that had previously been settled um, by the protocol, that kind of protection of Good Friday Agreement of North-South cooperation. Um, now, I think there are new questions about them, because if the UK government doesn't adhere uh, to its obligations under the protocol, there's a question of whether other measures should could have been taken. Um, so I think you do have to question whether the UK government is genuinely trying to protect the Good Friday Agreement um, with this particular move, or whether there might be other motivating factors here. Thanks. Thanks, Jess. If I could turn to you, Lord Bruce, now, I'm, I mean, having sort of just listened to Jess set out what these powers will do, why do you think that, that the sort of inclusion of these powers in the bill has provoked such a strong reaction from the House of Lords? Well, I, I think probably the most powerful speech against it came from Michael Howard, former leader of the Conservative Party, and a very staunch Brexiteer. Um, I mean, his basic view was simple. We are about to launch ourselves on a, an expectant world to negotiate trade deals all over the place, including the United States. Um, and we are announcing our intention to do that on the basis. But by the way, any agreement that we take, we can set aside unilaterally at any time. This is not the basis for negotiating trade agreements. And we've seen the reaction from Congress and, and indeed in the middle of the presidential election campaign that if the UK does this and puts itself at odds with the EU and threatens the Northern Ireland agreement, then any suggestion of an easy route to a trade deal with the United States uh, would be at risk. So it, it's trashing really the UK's reputation as a country that uh, stands by its word and stands by its obligations. And I think you could detect from the speeches the level of anger uh, especially from the Conservative benches, but right across the House. Um, I didn't actually get the final tally, but a substantial number of Conservatives voted against the government. Um, so I, I think that says it all, really. Yeah, and I mean, there's been a lot of speculation about the, the fact that the, these clauses might have been included in the bill as a sort of negotiating tactic with the EU to try and reach some sort of conclusion with um, on the future relationship. And so therefore, there's a sort of bit of a speculation that given, I think, report stages in a couple of weeks time, two or three weeks time, the government may remove the, the, the clauses themselves from the bill if they have reached a deal with the EU. Now, I mean, I guess I'd be interested in your reflection on whether this this is a good negotiating tactic at all. But also, if we get to to a point where there either isn't a deal with the EU or the government has decided to walk away from negotiations. Do you think then, given we've seen that sort of big vote um, last week, do you think Peers will look to remove these clauses from the bill? Do you think there are the numbers there to do that? I think they will. The question is, how many times will we do it? I mean, I'm absolutely certain we will. The question is, will we go on doing it? But I, I think the other thing uh, we, you should take note of, and it relates to the rest of the bill, there's an element where this is a game of politics I'm sure it comes from Dominic Cummings, and it's about saying we'll show the world that we are we can play tough, but never mind the reputation of the UK being trashed at the same time. It also takes attention away from the rest of the bill, which actually has much more far reaching implications for the future of the United Kingdom. And it suits the government to have a row about the international law aspect because that stops people realising what's going on in the devolution settlement. Um, I, 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 you will appreciate that my whole approach to this is total cynicism. I believe this is a, a kind of politicking from a, a government that does not care about the United Kingdom's reputation and more to the point, doesn't care about its own reputation because it's perfectly happy, A, to tell lies or to say one thing on Tuesday and the opposite on Wednesday and just carry on. So I can't predict what will happen, but I think the determination and the anger in the Lords tells me ping pong will happen more than once. Yeah, it does. It does definitely seem that way, having watched some of the speeches uh, last week. Um, if I could just bring you in here, Lord Dunlop, and I guess invite you slightly to speculate um, on the sort of perspective of the views of your, your colleagues on the Conservative benches in the House of Lords. Again, I mean, we will come on to some of the other devolution issues right now, but, but I am sort of interested in your view on whether you think that if the government doesn't remove the offending clauses, whether you will see quite a significant rebellion from, from the Conservative peers. Well, I, I think we saw during the, the second reading, I mean, there was a very significant um, rebellion uh, on the Conservative benches. I mean, I think from memory, there were about 39 uh, Conservative peers who voted against uh, the uh, government and um, a further 60, I think, um, who abstained. So that is a significant uh, rebellion uh, under any, any circumstances. Um, I mean, I think the House of Lords generally sees itself very much as the guardian of the Constitution. 
So we take these matters very, very seriously. And the rule of law is, you know, the most fundamental constitutional principle. And um, I think, you know, we saw from the debate that people felt that um, the powers that the government is taking the bill are pretty unprecedented. We heard lots of examples of precedents, but we looked at that in the Constitution Committee and we think the powers that uh, were taken in this bill or are being taken in this bill are fairly unprecedented. The question is, you know, to what extent will the House of Lords press its point? And I think uh, the, the, the other two, Malcolm and Angela, are probably in a better position than me on that. Um, but I think there will be um, significant Conservative peers who will want to push this um, quite, quite far. But I think the House of Lords is always reluctant to press the nuclear button, if I can put, put it that way, uh, and stand against the elected House. But I think a, a general point I would make not just on, on the rule of law uh, implications, but when we come to talk about the devolution implications, I mean, when we're talking about the integrity of the union, it's very important that provisions uh, regarding the union carry cross-party support. And I think it would be very unfortunate if the bill is sort of forced through uh, on the back of um, conservative votes alone. Thank you. I think that's a really interesting point about the sort of looking at the cross party support. And it is something that I think it's notable to see that it, it's tends to it tends to appear easier for the House of Lords to work on a cross-party basis, and it might be something that'd be interesting to reflect on later in the discussion. I know, uh, Baroness Smith, you wanted to come in, and um, so, I mean, I guess it's also an interesting question from my, I sort of would like to ask you in terms of how far you think that peers might be able to push this. It's hard to know at this stage. I think one thing just to flag up, because of the significance of this issue, you've mentioned you vote in at report stage, which the House of Lords traditionally does. It doesn't vote at committee, tends to leave votes to report. Um, on this issue, I think we're going to vote at committee um, because I think the House is very clear where it's at, and that was a 226 majority. It wasn't just um, the number of Conservative peers who supported that, it was who they were for leaders, former cabinet ministers, um, a significant number of those who were very pro Brexit, but are so appalled at government trying to overrule the right of law that they could not say, well, basically, they said, not in my name. So I think there's two things there. Um, so and that would leave time when we get to report stage for the other parts of the bill, the devolution aspects, which are of equal concern to be given all the time they need as well. So I think it's quite likely to we'll see an early in the next couple of weeks, depending on how long the uh, committee stage lasts. It's scheduled for just four days. And I hope we can do it in that time, two days this, two days next week, that we'll have an early vote on that to give an indication to government. Now, there's still part of me hopes the government will see sense on this. Um, so I think it's probably wrong of us to put all the blame on um, Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings. You know, Conservative MPs trooped through the lobby on this bill and the concession that was given to the MP, personally, I think is completely worthless because basically you can break the law as long as you vote to do so, which doesn't really help very much. So how far will we take it? I think we want to see um, some metal from MPs. And I think I saw a question just came up about the law's regards itself as the uh, custodian of the constitution. Isn't that a role for MPs as well? I think that's really true. How MPs say, oh, we can vote to break the law because as Brandon Lewis said, it's a neat, specified and limited way. You know, if I go out tomorrow to the supermarket and shoplift, but only very specified and limited shoplifting, I am still breaking the law and at the time when the government is really pressing people to abide by um, regulations on COVID, for example, it is rich to say we can break the law ourselves. And I think it has such wide implications, um, not specifically on the details of treaties so much, because having signed a treaty and then in a few short months say, oh, we didn't really understand what we're signing or we've changed our minds and wanting to renege on it, in, you know, actually, that sends a message to others that we really can't be trusted to stand by our word. So that's why I think it has such strong resonance. So there's the, the large, well, the large labour numbers, the numbers, large number of Conservatives, 39, but also if you look at the benches, who normally go you know, sort of half and half or 30, 40, or, you know, they, they, they won't always go with one side. That was overwhelmingly 
on this issue in support of maintaining the rule of law. So I think the implications on this would indicate there's a very, very strong feeling, but we also have perhaps higher expectations of MPs and they have themselves. Thanks, and if I can just very quickly follow up and um, I think my colleague Jill Rutter put a question in about how long the Lords might resist. So you've talked about um, ping pong, uh, you know, if, if those clauses are still part of the bill or the government hasn't removed them. Um, do you, will the Lords try and ensure the bill's not in force at the start of next year? Do you have any any sense yet or will we get better sense once once it sort of everything starts? I think this, you know, I would hope that the government sees sense of this, um, but there is determination, I think, from many in the House of Lords. And I think you'll find a lot of MPs might sort of have to start to have second thoughts about the implications internationally if that clause remains in the bill. Great, thank you. And and I think we'll for the moment we'll um leave those those clauses there. And I mean, obviously, again, people watching do feel free to fire in some more questions. But we have discussed, we've alluded to it quite a lot that there are some quite significant implications of the bill for devolution. And, and um, I agree with you, Lord Bruce, this didn't get much attention when the bill was first published. It was something that the IFG has definitely wanted to engage with and draw attention to. So if I can bring Jess in again um, here. Um, Jess, I've got sort of two questions for you, but I will ask them one at a time. Um, firstly, can you just say what what is it that the bill does in terms of trying to regulate trade within the UK? Yeah, so the UK government argues that the bill is necessary to prevent barriers to trade. That itself, I think, is contested. Uh, there are other programmes of work going on through common frameworks we've mentioned a few times um, that, that also have that same aim. Um, but what the bill does is it enshrines two principles in law. Uh, the first is mutual recognition, which says that anything lawfully imported into or produced in one part of the UK is automatically acceptable in the other. Uh, the second principle is non-discrimination that would prevent um, um, Ed the devolved governments or the UK government acting for England, uh, placing new requirements on goods entering uh, their part of the UK from elsewhere that aren't in place um, on local goods. Um, so there are some exceptions to these principles um, for the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so it's not quite fair to say that it would completely um, create completely unfettered trade within the UK where Northern Ireland is required to apply EU law. Um, that will still be the case. Um, but I think essentially what it does is it allows the devolved administrations and the UK government acting to England to continue to regulate goods produced in their part of the, the UK but not necessarily goods sold. Um, so the UK government argues that it's necessary to provide certainty to businesses that they will continue to be able to sell their products across the whole of the UK. Um, but there's a question of whether um, this is appropriately balanced um, with the ability to the devolved administrations to produce, um, pursue their legitimate policy aims um, for which they might need powers to regulate the goods that are sold on their markets. And I think there's a big question here as to whether um, the UK government has got the balance right in the bill. And we, you know, we've heard that the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales label this a power grab. Um, I think the, the, the sort of preferred phrase of the UK government is this is a power surge. Um, from your view, Jess, who's right? So actually, in terms of the bill, there are very few powers changing hands here. So there is, is one example of state aid, which the bill clarifies or, or uh, or says um, is reserved. That was previously a contested matter. Um, but apart from that, there's very little change to the devolution settlement in terms of uh, powers, but it does place a new constraint of how the devolved administrations exercise those powers. So the UK government's arguing that uh, the bill simply replaces these mutual recognition and non-discrimination principles that already exist in EU law. Um, so it's arguing there's no new constraint here, but actually there are some fundamental differences in what the UK government is proposing through this bill um, and how the EU framework operates. So one of those is the, um, the matters um, of, that are excluded from these principles. Um, so in the EU law, there's some quite broad exclusions, basically for any kind of public interest matter. If the government can make the case that this is to pursue us a certain policy aim, uh, that that is permissible. In the UK framework, there are some very narrow exemptions for uh, threats to human and animal health, the fertilizers to chemicals, um, but really there's not the same kind of ability there for uh, the devolved administrations uh, to pursue aims that might be um, in contrary to the principles of this bill. 
Um, another way that it's it's different is that the EU framework is underpinned by thousands of harmonising uh, regulations that set minimum standards and prevent sort of a race to the bottom effects that could occur um, in the event that goods are acceptable everywhere in the UK. Um, again, there could be a role for common frameworks here, but that's not that's not attached explicitly um, to the bill. Um, there's also questions about the kind of asymmetry of the UK's constitutional arrangements. Um, so the bill would prevent uh, the devolved, devolved legislatures from amending or um, modifying the application of, of this bill. And what's that, what that means is essentially they can't override it in any cases. Um, but the principle of UK sovereignty, uh, UK parliamentary sovereignty means that the UK Parliament does retain the ability to do that. There's also a number of regulation, pa regulation making powers um, in the bill that would allow the UK government and ministers to amend the, the sorts of uh, requirements that are captured by this legislation and also the list of exclusions. Um, in some cases, they're required to consult with the devolved administrations before they do that. In others, they aren't. So essentially, there's um, the way that this is set out would potentially give the UK government and ministers there the ability to uh, change parts of the bill if it didn't suit perhaps their policy aims and the devolved administrations don't have that equivalent power. There's also many more questions about how exactly the bill is enforced. In the EU, the European Commission plays a role in this. Um, in this bill, I think this is one of the areas where there is really very little clarity. It's not exactly clear um, what kind of intergovernmental mechanisms there might be to resolve disputes. There's an ongoing review of that, um, which we're hoping to report soon, but we still we still don't know how disputes might be resolved. Um, and there's also a question of exactly what role the courts might play. Um, so I think it is fair to say that although not necessarily a power grab or a power surge, um, it definitely places a new constraint on the exercise of devolved powers that wasn't there before, with much less clarity as to what happens if there's a dispute exactly on the interpretation or the application of these principles. Thanks, Jess. I mean, that was that's a lot, lot to unpack there. And I think, I mean, what I'm struck by from what you're saying, you know, one of the things that the IFG has been saying quite a lot is there's just still quite a lot of uncertainty just in terms of how this will work in practice. And I think that clearly that that's something that um, I'm sure peers will, will get into over the next few weeks. Um, Lord Dunlop, if I can bring you in here, you know, uh, and you know, we do we do have a question in the chat about the review that you conducted um, into how Whitehall could work better with the devolved administrations, and that you know still hasn't been published. And there is a bit of a question about why it is still gathering dust in Number Ten and hasn't been published. But I mean, I, I would be interested to hear your your thoughts on that. But I've also sort of more broadly interested in how. How you think the UK government has sort of handled the, the sort of relationship with the devolved administrations around the bill? I'm struck by the fact you've already mentioned that actually you think sort of cross party working is very important if you're going to make changes to the constitution. I mean, I guess would, what advice might you give the government in terms of how it might want to, to, to sort of continue to handle it going forward? Well, I mean, I think the thing I would say about this whole debate is, you know, to quote that famous phrase, it's deja vu all over again, because um, I mean, I think Parliament has really debated these issues in the context of the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. And that was a very contentious issue uh, then. You know, uh, The EU has provided a constraint on the devolved administrations and how they legislate and regulate. And as we come out of the EU, it's perfectly reasonable to say that we should put in place uh, an equivalent UK regime uh, and everybody agrees um, across the house, across parties um, with the aims of this bill that we should have seamless trade within uh, the, the UK. But I think the questions are, um, is the bill necessary uh, at all to achieve those aims? Uh, and is it necessary to move forward uh, at this speed and in this way? And I think to pick up on Jess's point, and it sort of relates a bit to my, my um, report, uh, the parallel bit of work um, is about the whole architecture of intergovernmental uh, working. Because although this bill is an economic bill, it is an economic bill that has huge uh, constitutional implications. And as Jess rightly said, there are big gaps on, on that side of the equation uh, which the bill doesn't uh, uh, address uh, at all. So uh, I, I am on record as um, describing the bill as a sledgehammer to crack a, crack a nut. 
Uh, and um, I think if the government had taken a little more time, uh, some of those missing pieces could have been put in place before motoring ahead with this legislation. And I think, you know, if we think about the, the, the future for the union and for the United Kingdom, do we want a, a union of uh, cooperation or a disunited kingdom of competition and conflict? And I'm absolutely clear, uh, we want a union of cooperation. Uh, the union has got to feel going forth like a joint endeavour, uh, not that uh, it is a, a sort of system where London does things to other parts of the country. Do you think that there's anything that the UK government can do now to try and either sort of repair um, the sort of heavy handed sledgehammer approach that they've taken um, or, or to try and sort of win back that trust to get to a place where they can try and work with the devolved governments to actually have that sort of union of, of cooperation that you've just sketched out? Um, a a absolutely. I mean, and I, I, I have been very encouraged by what uh, Michael Gove, who seems to be the sort of supremo for the union, has been saying. I mean, his his rhetoric, if you like, has, has been very good. It's been all about you know, working together and putting uh, the relationships between the governments within the UK on a firmer basis. And that is exactly the right approach. But actions speak louder than, than, than words. And I think it would be a tremendous statement of intent by the government were they to take those words of Michael Gove and, and, and translate them into how they approach this bill and that they will work constructively uh, with the House of Lords uh, to amend the bill to, to make it more of a joint decision making effort uh, and also to make it as, as the governments agreed it should be more equivalent in terms of the flexibility it allows the old administrations to the EU regime it's replacing. Well, hopefully government ministers listen to this to this event, but also I'm sure you'll be having that debate um, later uh, in, in the, the chamber. Um, Lord Bruce, I wonder if I can um, turn to you now. You're, you sit on one of the newly established committees in the House of Lords on um, common frameworks, the sort of other pattern of work that's been undertaken for the last, I think, three years um, between the devolved um, administrations and the UK government trying to sort of work out some of the answers to some of these questions. Um, one of the sort of uh, the, the sort of uh, complaints that has been raised quite significantly about the bill is the fact that it could end up fueling a race to the bottom um, between the nations. Do you think that the sort of work that's been done around common frameworks might be one way to address that? I mean, how do you see that interplay between common frameworks and the UK internal market bill? Well, that, that's absolutely the crunch issue. The common frameworks, which were set up three years ago, appear to have worked through, are working through extremely well. And they set out principles and they exactly the principles that Andrew Dunlop um, wants the government to say underpin their approach, which is about consensus, about negotiation, about agreement, about respect for the devolved settlements. All that's missing from this bill. Quite the reverse. This bill is setting all that aside. Uh, Michael Gove, said at the weekend he was setting up a unit to counter the SNP and the drive to independence in Scotland. Well, he will be wasting his time if he carries on with the tone of this bill, because that will just fire it up. So the question a lot of people are asking is, why can't the principles that are established within the common frameworks be enshrined in the approach of this bill? Although people are also saying, do we really need this bill? I mean, where is all the threat coming from? It's almost as if this is a solution looking for a problem. Um, and the, most people would say, we're not in a hurry. Um, we can't change things quickly. And we should really wait to see whether or not these kind of differences, differences approach. And in the meantime, apply an approach of negotiation. There's one other point, however, which I think Jess touched on, which is a fundamental flaw in our constitution, which we, we may have to address. If we do have a dispute resolution, and within the common frameworks, it has been identified but not yet used. In the frameworks, it's about really exhaustive negotiation to try and secure consent. But in the end, if there isn't consent, the final appeal when it's gone through all that process is to UK ministers, who of course are also English ministers. And the problem fundamentally is that they can set that aside. And that is really a problem because it means that they can, England effectively can overrule 
and the intent behind the bill clearly is that's what they want to do and that's where the race to bottom bottom comes in so let's take the let, let's take uh, beef farmers in scotland you know premium beef suddenly they face competition because the uk has negotiated a trade deal for hormone beef from america or whatever it may be or something from argentina i don't know the idea that this would happen without proper consultation and consent of the beef farmers of Scotland. That is what people are worried about. And the fact is the government can set that aside. And there's another section of the bill where they're also saying, and I don't know why they need to do that because they have the power anyway, but they're putting it in the bill that they are will be able to spend money in the devolved areas in any area they want without any reference to the elected representatives in those devolved areas. That is just a piece of aggressive bullying. So if I guess I can ask you a similar question that I asked Lord Don Dunlop, you know, what is it then that you you want to see? I mean, you sort of sketch out some of the big issues or concerns you have with the bill, but what is it that you then want to see from the UK government to actually be addressing these concerns? How do you think the bill needs to change to try and yeah. sort of find a way through? Well, I think the first thing to do is that they should delay the implementation of these first four sections of the bill, and they should then establish the common frameworks principles and work those through both with the existing frameworks and if there are any other issues that need to be applied. And only then, and they've established both those principles and a dispute resolution mechanism, should they enact that part of the bill. I would suggest to Michael Gove, the advantage of that is it would take the pressure off right now. It might also get you to the other side of the elections in Scotland and Wales uh, before you actually have to enact any of these powers. So uh, Michael Gove comes from Aberdeen, my home area. He's, he's a bright boy. I think he should see if he wants to achieve a constructive settlement and he wants to take on the nationalists in a reasonable way, then delaying that or abandoning would be the best thing to do. Thank you. No, that's that's very interesting. Um, Baroness Smith, if I can bring you in here now, and I mean, you've, you've already sort of set out again some of the concerns um, that, that you have with the bill. Um, I mean, I think there are nearly 200 amendments have been tabled already. Um, what are the sort of, again, the top priorities from la the Labour Party's perspective in terms of trying to tackle the bill? And sort of what, what are your either concerns or where do you think it can be improved? Well, how long have you got? <laughs> it's, it's a big question. I think the first thing we want to do it will be have common frameworks at the very beginning of the bill. I think the point everybody made about common frameworks um, so that market access principles apply after you agreed common framework so you know points have been made it's almost like that process has never started is it working in tandem with this bill is this bill trying to trump the common framework's process so um, that would be a very early amendment and i think also the issues around working with the default administrations for example the uh, office for internal market there's no default administration's input into that and that's a huge mistake um, and why that would be the case, it's hard to understand unless you're to get into the government's mindset of how they're approaching this bill. I also something else the government could do. They should actually publish Andrew Dunlop's report before proceeding, because that may help you know, inform a lot of the things we're doing. And I think, Andrew, you made this point in the St. Reason in the House of Lords as well, and you made it today. What kind of future arrangements do we want for the UK? Who wants to be in constant conflict of having to argue over each deal, and, you know, constantly have these disagreements ongoing? Or do we want a position where we have mutual respect, discussions, and you do it and have discussions in some kind of cooperation? Now, this bill sets the tone for the future relationship within the UK, um, and it will have an impact on the future of the UK. So. I think it's those kinds of issues we will be looking at. Um, we can go through lots of amendments and <laughs> bore you with them all, but I think there, there's basic principles at stake here. I think the Common Frameworks Amendment would go a long way to that. Um, the engagement with the devolved administrations um, and just sort of look at what more can be done to create trust rather than distrust. Um, Malcolm raises the point that we actually need this bill. The government's chosen this route. They will have an explanation of why they've chosen this route. In lots of ways, like they've dealt with the part five of the bill, um, where they're doing with the other parts, the other four parts as well. It is you know, a very aggressive way of managing things. I think we all agree we need a way of managing the internal market within the UK. 
But the, the way the government's doing this bill, the best thing they could do is actually say, what are the amendments that are needed for cooperation to this bill rather than convict? And publish Andrew's report and sit down and work out how we can do that. But at the moment, they seem to be, as on other issues, pretty much tone deaf. And I'm hoping as the bill goes through the rules, a little bit more thought and consideration will put it through to government ministers. And I hope that MPs are listening. It's very easy. And I, you know, um, Malcolm was a member of Parliament as well. And it's very easy, particularly when you're in government, you get your whip sheet of what you do and you, mar you march through the lobbies. I think on an issue as important as the rule of law and the devolution arrangements future of the UK, um, there's huge constitutional implications here that go way beyond party loyalty as a national interest. I think MPs have to step up to the mark and listen to the debate of what's ongoing, look at the detail, and they have to think very, very carefully before they kick back on the sentence. Thanks. I'm, I'm sort of pleased you mentioned um, MPs because that was going to be my sort of next question to you. Really, is you know again we've, we've sort of talked about how far how far peers might go on on questions of rule of law, but I think it is it's very interesting to see that and uh, much of the debate in the Commons really did focus on the questions of the clauses relating to Northern Ireland, and it, it felt like there wasn't a huge amount of consideration of some of the broader devolution issues. And so, given that you know, I'm struck very much by the conversation we've had so far is there's clearly quite a broad consensus around some of the sort of concerns or approach amongst at least the three of you. I appreciate that we haven't got everyone from the House of Lords on this panel, but but there seems to be sort of some kind of uh, consensus around that. And again, I'm interested in, in whether you think that peers will be willing to sort of push back a bit more on the Commons and sort of, you know, possibly ask them to think again once, twice, three times around some of these issues. I never like to put a thing on this because I'm always optimistic the government's going to see sense so we won't have to push back again. But I think you just have to say how serious these issues are. This is a, just a normal policy disagreement with political parties. This is far more fundamental. And I mentioned before about the Conservative peers that voted it, 39 of them. Just look at how serious those, um, those former cabinet ministers there are. Um, you know, Michael Howe has been mentioned, but Lamont, former um, deputy speakers, people who are cabinet ministers, um, Betty Boothroyd on the crossbenches, who is a former speaker of the House of Commons. You know, very, very serious people who care about the constitutional future of the UK um, will engage in this debate. So I suspect a number of those Conservative peers will be talking to their colleagues in the House of Commons as well. Some of them have only really fairly recently come to the House of Lords, so their relationship with the, uh, the MPs were pretty, pretty decent. So I think quite like to be a fly on the wall at the Conservative end of the room at the moment, because I suspect they'll be going back, um, albeit so distance, but having some of those discussions. I hope they are, because I think if the Conservative government pursues this sort of way they are, this bill, because the implications are so long term, You'll have many coming back and saying, I wish I'd done things differently. We're already seeing that on you know, the free school meals, the days. This one, the implications are longer to sink in, but it, the seriousness of it really can't be overestimated. It's hugely serious. And, you know, Andrew, you know, make a plea in for his report to be published because that can help form. But I'm serious about this because it's very easy for girls to do policy in a vacuum. You need to have policy that's informed by know, research by facts, by the detail. And I'm not sure the MPs, to be fair to them, had the time to consider all that detail. And perhaps if all the bills that I've seen, this one benefited from pre-legged scrutiny more than many others, because I think some of the issues we're now grappling with in the House of Lords could have been dealt with in pre-legged scrutiny had they had evidence taken sessions in them away. No, that's really that's a really interesting point. Um, Lord Donald, if I could just turn to you, there's a question that's been put in and that I'd be interested in your view on. Um, there's a sort of so there's and I think that Baron Smith, you might have mentioned it or sorry, one of you, I think, mentioned the fact that there's this new sort of union director in the cabinet office um, reporting to Michael Gove. I mean, what what are your sort of hopes, I guess, for for having such a unit? And, and do you think that, you know, that might be able to, to sort of either improve the sort of relations with the devolved administrations or do you think it, it might go the other way? Well, I, I mean, I hope that if you have a, a kind of union directorate or union unit, um, that the first thing it should do is produce a clear, coherent and consistent strategy. And 
you know, as a conservative and unionist, you know, I'm very disappointed that 18 months after the prime minister declared himself to be minister of the union, it does not seem to me that we have a clear uh, and consistent strategy from the government on its approach to the union. And I think, you know, some of the uh, sort of briefing that we saw over the weekend, you know, about more sort of press offices in Edinburgh. I mean, that's not really going to cut it. <laughs> we need something much more uh, deep and thought through. Uh, and yes, uh, you know, my colleagues have, have mentioned it. I think a good start would be to uh, publish and implement, you know, what I think is a very carefully thought through strategy for the union and the government's approach to the union in the report that I was asked to undertake. And I would just say, yes, it was commissioned by Theresa May, but I only took it on uh, when the two leadership candidates had been asked uh, whether they would support such a review. So they did support such a review. And I think it's very disappointing that the government has been sitting on it for, for so long. Can I just, I think the thing that worries me, I, I mean, I think it's good that they, there is a rebuttal, if you like, of the rising tide of independence, because actually living in Scotland, uh, frankly, the SNP are getting away with the most fantastic presentation and people who are quite astonishing the people who are saying I'm going to vote for independence who never said they would before it makes no sense in my view it's a deeply damaging and divisive but the UK government if they want to counter that have got to show that there is a positive and and valuable um, UK dimension which shows respect and accommodates the diversity of views across the UK. That has been completely lacking and the tone of this bill is much worse than what's been completely lacking. Let's be honest about it. So it really is time to wake up and recognise that this union could disintegrate partly because of poor language but also, and it's Angela's point, because people are sleepwalking and not realising what's going on. I can tell you there are people in Scotland who will say, I don't think the, the Conservative Party cares if the UK breaks up. That's the impression they give. I'm sure they do. I know Andrew does. But the government needs to show not only that it cares, but it's got practical ways of demonstrating to people across the UK that we can work well together and we can get a much better arrangement for all the citizens of the UK by doing that rather than encouraging this quite confrontational and divisive approach. And this bill is really just not helpful at all at this time. Lord Dunlop, you wanted to come in as well on that. Yeah, no, I, I did. I did want to come in because, I mean, let, let's sort of raise our sights from, you know, the detail of this bill to where we are as a country. You know, we are facing a national crisis. It's a national health and economic crisis. And I think what this crisis has demonstrated more than anything else is how interdependent we are. And I think it's become, you know, it's been quite a shock to, to some people in, in, in London, the reality of devolution. Um, so it seems to me that at a time of national crisis, when you do need to work together, that is absolutely the moment to try and reset the relationships in a different way. And I hope the government will, in a very positive way, take that opportunity. Thanks. Um, Baron Smith, I know you wanted to come in, but also I'm going to give Jess a warning that I'm going to come to her because she's been doing a lot of work on um, on sort of the impacts of coronavirus on, on the sort of relationship with the devolved government. So I'd be quite interested to get her thoughts on that. But first, Baroness Smith. Well, I just wonder if the government's whole approach to the bill is very aggressive tone. It's something we've seen throughout the legislation we've dealt with on Brexit from the very beginning. And we don't see it in other legislation that comes through the government. But as soon as you talk Brexit, the tone and the mood, complete changes into this very aggressive tone. Um, it comes through in the legislation that we've seen before and really is unhelpful. And, you know, Michael Gove is his unit, but you wonder if they see a political response and then not some legislative response that they really need to do. So I think there's a there's a disconnect somewhere in Down Street. That they don't realise that their very actions are making um, a vote for independence in Scotland the more likely. You know, rather having a unit set up and sending Michael Gove to be nice to people, it would certainly be much better if we look at the laws that they're putting forward and actually in that show that the recognition of the devolution arrangements in the UK is something to be valued, something that we you know we treasure in many ways, 
and we've matured. I want Sydney to mature, but just says the unit, I'm a bit skeptical. I think it's realising there's a problem, but try to tackle it in PR terms rather than really in serious policy terms. Thank you, Nora. I think that's that's an important point to make. Um, so yeah, Jess, I mean, I, I'd be interested at having, you know, you've been listening to this conversation, you've been looking at um, the relationship between the UK governments and the devolved administrations, both around coronavirus, but also in this context, <coughs> Um, I mean, where do you think sort of things stand at the moment? I mean, what, what would you say the UK government might need to do if it, if it wants to sort of rebuild some of those relationships? Yeah, I think it's interesting that both um, the a lot of the, the exercise of the powers we're talking about in relation to the UK internal market bill, so powers over kind of agricultural and go goods um, regulation, which are extensively devolved, and powers um, in order to... Uh, cope with the coronavirus crisis are also extensively devolved. And I think the UK government hasn't really figured out a way of working with the devolved administrations on this kind of equal basis. Um, it's very used to acting in reserved areas where it might consult the devolved administrations. Um, and it's it's quite used to working, you know, on uh, domestic policy where it, it's completely in control. Um, but I think there is a kind of third way of working um, that I think there need to be better mechanisms um, in order to facilitate this. So we've seen the four governments go um, for quite different approaches um, across the coronavirus crisis. We're seeing that that more now, and I think that is completely legitimate. It is their powers um, to do that. But there is a question of whether actually a more unified approach could have been helpful. But the only way to, in order to be able to get that is through agreement. And that might mean compromise. It might mean the UK government not being able to do exactly what it wants because it wants to, it needs to reach agreement with the four administrations. And I think there are definitely parallels here with the kind of common frameworks program is that one way to deal with the UK internal market is to seek compromise, is to agree potentially kind of minimum standards or um, frameworks in which to operate, which might act as a constraint on ambitions. Um, but that's the way to be able to do stuff consensually is that sometimes it will require a limit um, on what, what the UK government might want to do. And I don't think it's quite it's quite got used to that new way of working yet. No, that's that's definitely interesting. And I think, yeah, Brexit definitely has raised those questions more fully. Now, now we'll be outside the EU frameworks from the end of the year. Um, just on the sort of common frameworks point, maybe, Lord Bruce, if I can come back to you. I mean, how how sort of confident are you that this this sort of process will be able to be put in place? Because as Jess has said, it does seem to it will require more compromise from the UK government. It is more of a sort of consensus building approach rather than a will take powers just in case. Um, do, do you... Are you confident that, you know, there will be sufficient common frameworks to address maybe some of the concerns that have already been raised about the bill, for example, race to the bottom? Well, I'm, I mean, I joined this new committee and we're just getting to grips with it, but we're also catching up with what's happened. But we've noticed that, for example, some of the information that's coming from the government side of the common framework is out of date. And yet they're demanding very rapid turnaround when the information they're giving to us and the committee and the is out of date. So that raises the question of how serious the government are, whether they really do regard the common framework. They say they are. And they say that's the right approach. They then say, however, we have other concerns that don't fit the common frameworks, but when you ask them what they are, they're sketchy in the extreme. They start saying, oh, well, Sc Scots whiskey people may not be able to import barley from England. No evidence to back that up whatsoever. Um, they talk about, for example, building standards, completely unaware apparently that building standards in Scotland have been different since pre-devolution times. Um, so the government is not showing that they're really on top of this or that they're fully in process. I think the general consensus in the Lords, and I wish it was picked up in the Commons, is that the common frameworks have been working through on a set of principles for three years, and those principles need to be incorporated into the next stage, whether it's through this bill or frankly by abandoning the bill, carrying on with common frameworks, adding where necessary, and then coming up with a dispute mechanism as and when and if it's necessary. That would create a much more constructive environment, it seems to me, and is the case. Just a sort of side point about the, 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 the sort of the, the, the UK wide approach. In reality, in Scotland, we are getting the benefits of furlough, we're getting the bets of bounce back loans, huge billions of pounds of treasury money being spent in Scotland. I bet you if you stop 10 people in Princess Street and ask them, nine out of 10 would think that was being funded by the Scottish government, which is why they think independence tomorrow is fine. We have to confront some facts here. But the UK government isn't trusted. 
the Scottish government is very clever and people are actually making their decisions and or consideration of decisions without really understanding what's going on. The government has a responsibility really to get a grip on this. And I said it at the beginning, it's not a game and playing politics in this area is very dangerous. Thank you. And I, we've a question has come through um, from the Q&A, which I think is sort of an interesting challenge to the discussion we've had so far, you know, from Mary um, Corker and saying, you know, so far there's been a unanimous consensus for the union. And obviously, you know, the, that that's all of your each respective positions. Um, but sort of from a nationalist perspective, she's saying there is little by way of a convincing or credible answer to the question of what the union is for. Now, I appreciate I'm putting you all sort of on the spot, but I would be interested um, in sort of getting your view on that. Maybe, Lord Dunlop, I can start with you in terms of what you think the purpose of the union is for. And, and you know, you've said you're, you're in favour of the union, you think the government should be making that case. And I'm wondering what case you would be making if, if you were in the position to do so. Well, let's, let's remember that devolution is um, the unionist alternative to independence. And to me, the devolution within the United Kingdom offers Scotland, um, dare I say it, the best of both worlds. It um, provides huge amounts of local decision making on, if you like, domestic policy, but with the ability to come together across the UK, you know, that essential solidarity to deal with issues where a common cause is the right way to go. And I think that has been illustrated hugely during the pandemic, as Malcolm has already said. And if we come you know, to, to how the governments work together, I mean, at the moment, intergovernmental relations is, is a grievance fest. It's where you know, disputes are had you know, and uh, disagreements are fought, fought out. We want a much more sort of positive approach to intergovernmental relations. You know, how do the two governments or the three governments, the four governments work together on issues of common cause? I mean, we've got COP26 next year in Glasgow. Climate change, the, the, the objectives of the UK government and the Scottish government, the Welsh government and the Northern Irish executive, they're not very different. So let's actually be on the front foot, taking the initiative on those areas of policy where across the United Kingdom, we need to work together. That's what I would like to see. And I think that is what the United Kingdom offers each of its component parts. Thank you. And if, if I can put a sort of a similar question to you, Baroness Smith, sort of, you know, what is the Labour's vision for the union? What's, what's your, your position in terms of the future of the UK? I probably could say follow that, to be honest. There's, I don't think there's anything in what Andrew said I would agree with. And I'm one of those people who have it. I was described as a British identity. I have a Scottish mother, an English father, and I spent three and a half years of my um, political life as a Northern Ireland minister. And my name was Evans Roy Mavie. It's always felt to be sort of part of the one part of the UK um, is part of my identity. The only thing I would add is I think we're stronger together. And the issues that we deal with today that are complex, COVID's been mentioned, our economy, another one, how we import, how we export. Um, and the idea that we could be in such small units and be completely independent small units to me is anathema to how we operate as the UK. Now, but for that to, to remain us to, to the UK, I think it has to be respect the evolution settlements we've got. And I think one of the biggest drivers for people to talk about nationalism and independence is not to have identity as coming from the nations of the UK respected in the way it should be, either through legislation and government actions. So and I think it is tied up with the identity, but it is how we respond to that. Um, can I just come back on something I said, because we were talking about how you know, the embers will res respond to this. I think one of the things Lord has is, is a great advantage. We focus on legislation. That's our reason being here. So we have the time to read those reports and go through the details and stuff we're not allowed to read yet like Andrews, but we will at some point, um, I hope. Um, for MPs, the different pressures on them, and I've stopped an MP in 2010 after 13 years, and I saw my workload increase. And I, if we want MPs to deal with these issues in the way I think they need convention to do these constitutional issues, have to look at the way they work. 
um, as well. And I think there's a, a huge issue for our future constitution in what we expect of members of parliament of both houses and how they interact. That's a pet hobby of mine, sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's why I think well, we're covering a huge amount of ground in this discussion and I think it's, it's all really, really interesting. Um, Lord Bruce, if I can, if I, I'll sort of give you the, the final word, we've got a minute or so, um, but I mean, from your perspective in terms of, in terms of the sort of what the union is for, I mean, do you have any other thoughts that you, you would add to what we've heard so far? Well, just in passing, the SNP don't put anybody forward to the House of Lords. I wish they would. I think they, they made a mistake. We have to deal with that. But I think the, 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 the fundamental point is we need a, a, a respect, really, across the union. And I think that's what's lacking in the UK government. They either forget about devolution or they patronise us. And that just fuels the resentment that's creating the problems we've got. I agree with Andrew entirely. We are totally underestimating what holds us together and I don't just mean the economy I mean culturally as a family the UK is a family and if it does break up it will be extremely painful and disruptive and divisive for generations this is not something that can be people can wave the saltire or the Welsh dragon and say we'll be independent be wonderful There's, you're destroying 300 years of association so many intangibles that people don't even notice until they're gone Brexit was bad enough do that to a union of 300 years. And I think it really behoves the UK government to show vision and leadership. And I'm sorry to say this government is probably the worst in my lifetime for doing that. They've got a few months. Michael Gove is bright enough, maybe, if he can get the, the, the ear, then maybe listen to Andrew, read his report, apply it, take some sensible amendments from the Lords, give yourself time and space, and maybe you can turn it all around and save the day. Well, that was a sort of more positive ending um, to the to the event. Um, I'm really sorry to have to, to call a close to it now. I think we've covered a huge amount of ground. We sort of started off with questions of rule of law and ended up with some very um, interesting and complex and thoughtful answers on the future of the union. Um, one thing I will just say for those who haven't looked at the Q&A chat, um, John Kerr has said that um, crossbenchers, the mood amongst the crossbenchers on the rule of law issue is to stand firm however many rounds of ping pong are played. So we might see some more drama around that coming up. Um, but all I will do is say thank you Thank you so much to um, and a really great panel for such a fascinating conversation. As I say, I feel like we could have gone on for much longer. Um, thank you very much to all of you who have tuned in and for all of your brilliant questions. I'm sorry for anyone I didn't manage to ask um, their questions. Um, there were there were quite a few. Um, we will definitely at the IFD be following the upcoming debates in the House of Lords um, around the UK internal market bill. So do um, do keep an eye on all of our work on that and also on other issues facing devolution and the union. Um, if you do want to listen back, the audio and video will be available shortly on our website where more of these kinds of discussions are available. Um, thank you very much for tuning in and please do join us again for more IFG Alive live events in the future.